Dear students, the topic that I will be discussing today is sources of ancient Indian political thought. But ancient India is a sub-discipline within the broader discipline called Indian political thought. Today's lecture is devoted on, not specifically on the sources. The subsequent two lectures will be dealing with this aspect, but today's lecture will be some sort of a prelude to the sources of ancient Indian political thought. In today's lecture, what I will be doing is to divide this into four areas. First is, what is meant by political thought? Second, why do we need to study ancient Indian political thought? In other words, in what ways knowledge about ancient Indian political thought helps us to understand today's problems, the today's Indian political system, the problems that it is facing. So this is the second aspect, that is why do we need to study ancient Indian political thought? The third is the period, that is which period is termed as ancient India. This is no doubt a bit controversial as there have been differences of opinion regarding the exact time in which ancient India falls and also there have been different scholars arguing in favor of a particular timeline and another in a different timeline. So this is will be the third area of our discussion. And finally, we will discuss the historiography of the ancient Indian political thought. That is, who are the historians? When did they engage themselves into the terrain of ancient Indian political thought? That will be the fourth and the final area of our discussion in this lecture. So let us begin with the first area, that is, what is political thought? Before we go into what exactly is meant by political thought, let us have a preliminary, preliminary discussion on what is politics. Now, like many other concepts of the discipline of political science, politics is also a very slippery concept in the sense that there has not been any unanimity regarding the definition of the term politics. Normally, we say that Politics is something which is associated with power, with struggle for power, with conflicts, with reconciliation of conflicts, etc. So if we say that politics is something which is associated with power, then we have to find out what are the institutions where power is located. Now, normally or traditionally, state is regarded as the greatest and the largest repository of power. So, if we start with the institution called state, then we may understand that politics is something which is in some way or other is associated with the functioning, with the development, with the uh, activities of the institution called state. So politics primarily deals with power, with the institution called state, and obviously the human interactions, the relations among different human groups, the interpersonal relations, the ways human communities negotiate with the state, how the state reacts to the demands of the people. So these things come within the domain of political science. Now within the discipline of political science, normally two fields are regarded as the twin pillars of political science. One is political theory and the other is political thought. In fact, these two are so very important that we may consider them as the fit on which 
political science, the discipline of political science works. These two are in a way related but different areas. First is political theory. Political theory concerns with a very systematic, organized understanding, development and discussion of political ideas, activities and negotiations that go on within the four corners or within the contours of society. Now political theory may be of different kinds. Some are conservative theories which resist all kinds of changes and some are very revolutionary ones which in fact invite changes which say that it, this is the way in which change may occur in society. So, Political theory is a very systematic understanding of the different aspects of politics that go on within the various strata in a society. Now, what about political thought? When we talk about political thought, it is the different philosophers or the different political theorists who have contributed to the development of political theory or liberalism, they become important when we consider political thought. This is how the political thought of Locke, the political thought of John Stuart Mill, or the political thought of Hobhouse, they become important. So, political theory and political thought are no doubt interrelated, but their areas and domains are different. So this is the first thing that we should keep in mind that political thought is something which talks about the thinking, the thought process, the contribution of different political philosophers who have given them in their writings. Now here we must mention that the discipline of political science that we study in India, in the different universities in India are a little bit tilted in favor of the Western ideas, the Western thought, the Western political ideologies in the sense that we do not come across that much interest so far as the university system is concerned in the Indian political thought. We have noticed that most of the universities have two or three papers on Western political thought and theory, but a single paper or maybe sometimes half of a paper devoting on the Indian political thought. We have noticed that the ancient Indian political thought figures even less in the entire domain of the Indian political thought. Recently, since 1990s, we have noticed that ancient Indian political thought also forms a part or an important part of the Indian political thought. Now coming to the second aspect that why do we need to study ancient Indian political thought? We have to be very much aware of the surroundings of this scenario, our roots, our tradition, our heritage. Otherwise, we won't be able to understand the modern Indian political scenario, this situation. There have been several institutions that are taking place in modern India, several processes, several kinds of power struggles that are taking place in modern India. But if we do not look into our past, if we do not know the kind of political institutions that were developed in ancient India, we will be engaging ourselves in a futile exercise of knowing the contemporary India. Just let me put an example. We know that every society and Indian society is not an exception to that. Every society is basically an unequal society where we find there have been different strata existing in the society. Normally, the Western kind of explanation that we have received in our discipline is a very, very 
class oriented discussion where the economic component is considered to be the most important component. But in our case, in case of India, if we study inequalities only from the perspective of economic component and only from the perspective of class, then we will not be in a position to understand that, to comprehend that in a very total way. For that, we need to know that there is an institution called caste which plays a very, very significant role in the stratification system of the Indian society. For that, we have to look into the past. That in the past, how the institution of caste has evolved, how the society got divided along different castes, and in what ways caste and class also coalesce to form a kind of division, a kind of inequality from which we cannot ignore either caste or class. So we have to be very careful in order to understand the modern Indian political ramifications, we have to go back into the past. Another thing, uh, I may put another example here, welfareism for instance. It is a very, very popular concept today. Everyone, every citizen, every state is very aware of welfareism. How welfareism works, what kind of welfare state one has, whether the welfare services are really going to the people. These things have come into the discussion of political science and normally we begin with scholars and philosophers like John Keynes or Beveridge who happen to be British American scholars or Western scholars so to say from the 20th century and we say that this is a kind of welfareism, a kind of welfare state that the Western discipline or the Western kind of analysis has given to us. But what about our case? If we look into the ancient past, we find that Raj Dharma, this becomes a very important constituent of ruling and administration in ancient India. And there, Raj Dharma means commitment to the people. And commitment to people means welfareism of the people. So welfareism, is very much present in ancient India. It is not something that the West has given to us. It was present in our case and we have to be very, very careful again in order to understand the modern political problems. We should not look and go into the West for solution. We can find them from our very own case, we can look into the past and find that in what ways those rulers tackled problems and that can in fact very much help in our, our understanding of modern India. Now here, I should also caution you in one particular aspect. The way that I have presented ancient India may seem to you that ancient India is something which was absolutely perfect. There was nothing that may be termed as wrong, the rulers can do no wrong or something like that. This is however not the case. Ancient India has many things that are not sanctioned in a modern democratic society. Ancient India had a kind of society which was socially immobile in the sense that the stratifications were very rigid. People could not go from one profession to another. They could not, there was no possibility or there was absolutely, it was not possible for them to convert themselves to a different kind of caste. It was a very rigid society. Then, the position of woman, if we look into that, that was not at all something very 
very uh, good, that may look very good to us, to our modern eye. The women were totally absent from the public sphere of ancient India. But for this also, we need to look at the past. We need to know ancient Indian political thought. So this is the second aspect. Now coming to the third aspect, which period is called ancient India? This is a very problematic area in the sense that the starting point may be delineated with some perfection, but there is difference of opinion among scholars regarding what should be the time where ancient India should come to an end or ancient Indian political thought is giving birth to the medieval Indian political thought. So there have been some problems in this area. But at the same time, without magnifying those problems, I think we can come down to certain agreements and we can say that from this to this point of time, it is the ancient India and the thought pertaining to that period of ancient India is ancient Indian political thought. The starting point is normally now considered to be the Mehrgad civilization, which began in 8000 BC or the New Stone Age. New Stone Age shows us that people during that time developed certain tools, certain implements for their betterment of life, but those instruments and those tools were made up of stones. They did not know the use of metal and so this period is termed as New Stone Age. Now New Stone Age, people however learned or they lived in a communal kind of existence, they lived in communities, they took care of each other and they also learned the preliminary art of agriculture. They could grow certain cereals, they could develop certain basic amenities of life and in this way they were to a large extent civilized people and that is why the Mehrgar civilization is regarded as the starting point of ancient Indian political thought. Thereafter, it was followed by which we all know the Harappan civilization and the civilization of Mahenjodaro or the Indus Valley civilization. Now this civilization also belongs to the new stone age, but we normally get several other artifacts apart from the tools and implements which teach us, which show us that this civilization happens to be quite an advanced civilization. This civilization happens to be predominantly an urban civilization where they knew not only the art of agriculture, they also knew the life of a modern urban existence. Now from that period onwards, we find one after another the Vedic civilization, the post-Vedic civilization, the Mauryan civilization, the Gupta civilization, the post-Gupta civilization. That is, it continues till almost the first millennium, that is, till the uh, 10th century AD when there came some invasions from a different countries, something of different kinds, and normally this, that period heralds the birth of medieval political thought. So from 8000 BC till 1000 AD, this is the period of ancient India and the political thought associated with that period is normally termed as the ancient Indian political thought. 
Now coming to the now the area of the historiography of ancient Indian political thought that is the final section of today's lecture the historiography how the historians have developed their understanding of ancient Indian political thought. Now coming to this section let me tell you that prior to 1850s there was almost no scholarship no understanding of such a beautiful civilization that India had during that time. People were unaware of these kinds of civilization. That is primarily for two reasons. First is that people were not interested in ancient Indian scholarship. This is number one. And the second thing is that the archeological excavations that opened up those civilizations before the modern eyes did not take place that in that time. So till 1850s or I may say specifically till 1858 that is till the time when British took over the administration of India till that time there was no idea of ancient Indian political thought. From 1858 onwards, we find that there came about, there grew a kind of scholarship which may be termed as ancient Indian political thought and ancient Indian political scholarship. Now here also, we find primarily two kinds of perspectives. First was something which was developed by the British historians or the Western historians, they somewhat devised a kind of strategy and they presented their views within that strategy and nowadays that perspective is referred to as imperialist perspective. In that perspective, the scholars principal aim was to tell to the people of India that India happens to be a country which was never ruled in a democratic manner, which had always autocratic rule. People never had any say in the governance. The kings never took care of their subjects. So this was a kind of thinking that was put forward by the imperialist perspective and by the imperialist historians. Their argument was basically based upon the idea that the movements and the democratic demands and particularly the demand of self-government that the Indians were putting forward in the post-1857 war of independence period that demands are not justified. That is, the imperialist historians tried to convince the imperialist rulers as well as the leaders of India that you have never tested democracy. It is our intention and our rule that is trying to making your society somewhat democratic, but you have never experienced democracy, so you are not fit enough to demand democratic government. So this is the perspective that was first put forward in the post-1857 period, mainly by the Western historians to defend their argument and to resist the indigenous demands. Now against this perspective, evolved a kind of nationalist perspective. And we may mention the name of Tilak here, who was one of the pioneers in the nationalist perspective, who put forward their arguments and said, no, India had a kind of governance which was basically constitutional monarchy like the British that you have. It was not autocratic. The kings took care of the subjects they were welfareist in their attitudes. And this was the perspective put forward by Tilak and other historians. And this is the nationalist perspective. From 1916 to 1925, 
a host of scholars came forward and they in fact presented their views and from their contribution, Jaisawal, Bhandarkar, Sharkar, from their contribution, we have today a corpus of study which we may define as ancient Indian political thought and for this we should remain grateful to those historians who have unearthed different sources and put forward views about ancient India. In today's lecture, we have basically initiated ourselves to the ancient Indian political thought. We have divided this lecture into four areas. First is, what is exactly meant by political thought? The second area is why do we need to study ancient Indian political thought? Third is which period is normally referred to as ancient India and by that which period's thought is normally referred to as ancient Indian political thought? And finally, the historiography of ancient Indian political thought. By historiography, we principally mean the two perspectives. One is the imperialist perspective put forward by the British and the Western historians, mainly to defend their rule and to resist the changes of the Indian people. And the second is, the nationalist perspective put forward by the Indian scholars like Tilak and followed by Jaisawal, Bhandarkar, Sharkar and others whose justification was that India had quite a non-autocratic form of governance which was basically constitutional monarchy and welfareism was quite prevalent in ancient India. So Indian people are quite fit to rule themselves, to govern themselves and democracy is not something that the West has taught us. It was present in our case in ancient India. <laughs>